You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Option Block, your home for options, education, a little wit, a little wisdom, sometimes a little comedy, a little comedy as uh, we come to you, well, one day removed here on March 17th, 2016. Uh, I, Andrew Giovinazzi, um, a co-host, now the only host, at least for today, as Mark, as, as Mark is covering uh, the FIA for the Options Insider Radio Network. I am here for yet another episode of uh, the Option Block as we move from our 500 show, uh, what is this, 510 or something like that now, on to our uh, show number 1,000. And uh, things are moving along uh, in general quite well. Um, but since I'm really the only person to introduce myself, here I am. I'm Andrew the Rock Lobster from Maine coming to you on a, well, slightly rainy day here in uh, the land of pine trees and lobsters. And we will jump right into the action we had today on the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the uh, trading block where we're going to run down uh, some of the action that happened today uh, in the broader option market. And since I usually have the VIX chair, uh, I get the VIX chair again here as I count down. It's around 410 um, on Thursday afternoon. VIX is VIX actually traded in the 13 handle for the first time in 2016 today. Uh, volatility came in pretty much all over the place. Uh, I don't really know. The only place where volatility actually uh, <laughs> is, if there is any, is in the VIX futures, as most of the curve is in a pretty severe contango. Uh, the near-term VIX futures, the April future is trading a full three dollars, I think, above the cash in the 17 handle. So, at least from a future trader point of view, remember, you know, the futures, uh, the VIX futures, are a, uh, they are a, let's call it a forward representation of what the vol market thinks is going to happen. And at least for right now, they're not ready to accept a VIX at 14. Uh, of course, the Fed sort of said, okay, well, we're only going to raise, we thought we were going to raise a lot more. We're only going to raise two times. Market rallied yesterday, vol came in. Uh, market rallied again today, vol came in. So two days in a row. And we have kind of that sweet spot of um, record low vol. I'm not going to say record low vol, but let's just say call it year low vol. Uh, in VIX, and we also have uh, a 2016 high price in the SPX. So generally, when you have those things kind of moving in the correct direction, uh, vol down, market up, the market is accepting um, the move, the upswing we've had. Also, that means somebody's selling puts, right? Uh, there's There are premium sellers are starting to circle around and feel that it's safer to do so. So whether they're right or wrong, I don't know. But from a vol point of view, it's at least somewhat confirming 
of the rally that we've had over the last couple of days. So you look at, you know, names like Apple. It had a good day yesterday. Didn't do much today, down 17 cents. Uh, Amazon got whacked a little bit. Uh, Chipotle apparently is going to give away 9 million burritos. <laughs> and I don't know if I'd want one of their free burritos, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, doesn't matter. That knocked the stock down 28 bucks today. Um, the euro rallying uh, still on the fact that our rates aren't really going to go up a whole bunch. So you've got um, you've got some. I think the interest rate markets are and the currency markets are still in a bit of flux with all this uh, devaluing. But clearly, the U.S. is at least throwing the first. Um, they are taking a stand. They're not going to be lowering rates. If anything, they're going to be raising them, just not as much as they thought they. Uh, they thought they could, mostly bl blaming uh, global conditions, and softening trade or whatever reason that they want to have for a particular uh, moment. What I will mention, too, which is another volatility killer, is oil uh, back in the 40 handle today. As I look, I believe it closed over at least end of ordinary trading, closed uh, the spot feature closed over 41, yeah, 41.59 um, into the end of the day. So Oil higher, which means uh, a little less stress on the junk bond market for all of those explorers. Uh, some of them are really having trouble meeting interest payments, but at least uh, at least this slightly higher sli slightly higher oil prices, a little bit of short covering. Um, some production was came offline, so you have just a kind of a combination of things pushing oil back from around the twenty six twenty seven dollar range up to 41. So again, pretty big swing in oil up about, uh, let's I think up 50% from the lows already. Uh, so quite a move, uh, quite a move in oil overall. So all that, what all that does is it starts bringing the volatility down in the whole oil complex. And as I look, I think, but I'm not sure, let's just call it 90% sure. I think we're seeing at least the low for oil volatility in January, uh, at least for this year, we're starting to hit lows in realized vol and implied volatility for 2016. We haven't broken anywhere sort of near um, what I'll call a new low level. So uh, I think what we need to see is having oil kind of stay at this level, stay in the low 40s, maybe the mid 40s. Uh, that could start bringing some production back online, of course, but um, there was talk at OPEC of production cuts. All that stuff is uh, making volatility come in in oil uh, and the price go up. So all of that stabilizes uh, the high yield markets, like I said, and it also makes some of the explorers and producers come back. There's been a lot of short squeezes in a lot of these names as well. So you're seeing a lot of in some of the um, drillers, ETPs, uh, some of the pipeline companies, uh, the master limited partnerships, companies that were near dead that might have a shot if they can start make if they can make interest payments. So it's um, it's again, it's an interesting brew with a lot of stocks that are still at close to year lows. Um, they're off the bottom, but moving around a little bit. So. Uh, who would have thought that oil going up would be uh, good for stocks, but that's how the market uh, sees that. Just a couple other small uh, things going on. Uh, the SIBO is going to list options on the FTSE 100 and the China 50. Uh, looks like they got a deal um, to launch those indexes. And if anybody knows how to launch an index, it's probably the CBOE since for the most part um, <laughs> they've been investing inventing the marquee indexes for a long, long time, or at least trading on the marquee indexes uh, since as long as I can remember anyway. Um, there also, it looks like um, a combination of equity markets uh, as um, it looks like ICE is going to buy somebody else. Um, I'm looking at uh, at least um, – Deutsche Bank, uh, I'm sorry, the Deutsche Börse is going to buy the IS, uh, the ISE or the NASDAQ is going to buy it from the Deutsche Börse. It, it's, so, it's so hard to keep track of all these exchanges. Uh, when I was trading, <laughs> there was only five, and now there's 14. 
And I don't think it's added anything at all to uh, the value in the market. Um, but I think overall at this point, less fragmentation is probably better. Uh, we've, I think we've gone to the, gone over the point of so many exchanges are great for the marketplace. I think less, less connectivity, less problems uh, is probably better. I thought the five exchanges competed pretty well. And once they all went electronic, kind of all the gloves were off as far as competition went. So, you know, and again, we're at, again, today is a high for 2016. So uh, if uh, Mr. Tussaw was here, he'd probably be sharpening his call buying pencils because I know that's what he's looking for. And it would not surprise me to start seeing other highs if we could see, keep seeing the volatility go down. Um, I think the big fly in the ointment is still European banks. They still have to deal with that interest rate situation over there. So I'm not sure how long they can keep the rates negative over there without doing some sort of, you know, massive uh, three card Monty, uh, no pun intended on um, the, uh, the interest rate scene. I don't know how they're going to keep going, uh, keep making that happen. So, but be that as it may, the fed is still going to push for higher rates here because our economy is growing. What are you going to do? Economy is growing. There's some job growth. So having rates at zero seemed pretty ridiculous to me. And so they're going to jump on the rate hiking train and at least stay on the rate hiking train. And with that, we will close uh, our edition of the trading block and move on to my favorite part of the show, the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. And hello, everybody. Welcome to The Odd Block. This is the part of the show where we look at the... Uh, what does what, what Longo like to say? The soft underbelly <laughs> of uh, the options world where we see a lot of volume. This is kind of where the big paper is, uh, what is known as the smart money because they have a lot of money <laughs> to throw around. Um, it doesn't always mean it's the right money. But if you're a game theorist, you say, well, you know, somebody's going to buy 200,000 calls. Maybe they might know something. <laughs> Or at least that changes um, the odds somewhat, something worth taking a look at. So what we have today is um, a trade in EEM. Uh, EEM is the uh, Emerging Markets ETF. It's what, you know heavily traded uh, product. Um, the ADP is about 30, 332,000 contracts. So it's like you know one of the top 10 traded products for sure. Uh, the stock itself, the ETF was up 67 cents to 33.79 uh, when we wrote this up. And what did paper do? They traded 22,500 EEM, 842 and a half calls for 42 cents. Now, EEM, again, is closing um, in, uh, let's see here, in the low, uh, in the low, th in uh, 33.82. So, uh, having those calls out of the money like that is, uh, I would just say, a bit of a surprise. I just realized I put 42 and a half for the calls. They should be the 34 and a half calls. I, 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 uh, I was like to say, because they were <laughs> only $2 out of the money, which actually for the EM is a lot. It's about 6% or 7% up. So uh, we're going to have to rewrite that up and fix it. But uh it is the ape 34 and a half calls that traded 42 cents, 22,500 times. So also with that trade, though, a block of stock went up. Uh, 725,000 shares went up uh, through the offer at the time. So the calls traded on the offer and the stock traded through the offer on basically what was a massive match trade. And as I look at it, the trade looks about delta neutral. So there's about a 30 delta on those April 42 and a halfs. As I see it, uh, let's see, 34 and a halfs. I keep wanting to say 42 and a halfs, but it's 34 and a halfs. Um, 
It's about a 38 delta. So the trade goes up around delta neutral. Uh, so, and the way it's priced, it looks like either the customer got a, um, uh, a great fill trying to, uh, they got a, a, let's call it a tougher fill buying stock because they had to pay through the offer and they had to pay up for the option. So if they were buying the calls um, and they wanted to sell stock, they would have given them a great fill on the stock price. So it looks like anyway, from just where I sat on it, it looks more likely that the customer had to buy stock and they got a good price on uh, selling the calls against the stock. So it looked like it could be a front spread to me, essentially. So you buy calls, uh, you buy stock and you sell calls and you're just looking for the underlying to meander up to the 34, uh, 34 and a half range. So it, if, if indeed it is that direction, you're not expecting the stock to go up a whole lot because the ratio is uh, three to one, right? So when you see it priced like that, you're like, wow, the customer sold three calls to every hundred shares of EEM they traded. So yeah, I think about that in my head. I'm like, well, that is a pretty aggressive short gamma position, right? If you trade something three to one like that. So even though the pricing says or looks like the customer bought stock and sold the calls, right? It is also very possible that they bought three calls and sold the underlying stock and wanted to create a position with massive long gamma right around the strike at 34 and a half. So again, it's a, it's a tough one. It can be a call either way because the positions couldn't be more opposite in intent. Uh, they either want a massive front spread around the strike because they don't think the EEM is going to do anything or they want a massive back spread and watch the underlying move around. So a tough there was, and there was also just a huge, huge, huge paper overall going up in EEM. So I'm going to just mark that one as a, a tough one to follow. Um, myself, I don't know if I'd want to just really leverage that three to one buying once hundred shares of stock and selling three calls. To me, it looks like a little bit dangerous way to make some money. Uh, and you're basically calling the market locked and not moving between now and April, which, I mean, that could happen, but it just doesn't feel super likely given all the movement that we've had. Even though the way the trade was, it was priced to look like they bought stock sold calls. Um, but we'll, we'll see on that one. Uh, our next trade is in a name called gel of all things. This would have been uh, one of Mark's favorite type because it's the company is Genesis energy LP G E L and the acronym is gel. So it would have made him happy that somebody actually picked a symbol that sounds somewhat like <laughs> the name of the company. At least it's an acronym for the company. Uh, gel itself is trading around the middle of 52 week range. Uh, what does it do? It's a master limited partnership. We were just talking about that in the uh, trading block. And they're focused on the midstream segment of the oil and gas industry in the Gulf Coast region of the United States. They do pipe, offshore pipeline transportation, refinery services, um, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, today, I believe the stock was up about $1.51. So pretty big day uh, to $32.01. So the paper, uh, the trade that I saw anyway was they traded 5,800 of the June 35 calls over 2,900 of the June 30s. Prices they got for the uh, 35 calls were buck sixty, and the prices on the 30 calls were 420. Now you look at that ratio spread and you think, um, well, is it a money roll? Are they making money rolling up? Uh, the open interest on the 30s was 3,000. The open interest on the 35s was just a little over 1,000. So what it looks like is they closed the 30s and rolled up to the 35s. I think the tell was in the pricing, though, because uh, they did about 10 cents below theoretical to sell. I'm sorry, or they paid 10 cents over theoretical to buy the 30, uh, the 30 calls and they sold the June 35s for about 15 cents under theoretical. So 
it looks like they're just rolling a spread uh, or just rolling a short position, meaning they were short some of the 30s. The stock made a run. So instead of being having the stock called away, they rolled up to the 35s and they doubled their size uh, from 2,900. So we'll see tomorrow if that open interest holds true. It's probably a, a usually you see paper like this. It's a long stock position, and they uh, want to cover their calls because they don't want the stock taken away from them. They want some upside, so now they're going to reach and they're going to sell the 35 calls instead. Uh, with the stock trading around 32. So again, they, they still think there's a little bit of upside, but they definitely want to cover the shorter term uh, or the closer to the money calls that they have right now. So um, again, this is a stock that has been one of the few actually uh, limited partnerships that has been continually upping its dividend uh, for quite a while. Uh, it pays around 65 cents per quarter. And if they sell these calls, it looks like they would roughly double um, the income stream from the underlying. So I, at least on that part, I thought it was an interesting one to look at because, you know, there aren't many MLPs that are still consistently increasing dividend payments, but apparently this is one of them. So uh, you take that and I can see why the, uh, the trader wants to cover their short calls because uh, the stock today – and ended up having a massive move, almost up two and a quarter dollars by the end of the day. So I think that's one to keep an eye on. Uh, we'll just call it gel. It looks like gel is gelling at least for today. Um, and lastly, I thought this was an interesting one. You see trades like this when the market starts to uh, change character a little bit, but it was in the XLK, which is the uh, spider, uh, the technology spider. Uh, when I looked at it, it was up 21 cents to 43.79, and it's near. It's hard to believe, but the XLK right now is near the top of the 52-week range. I think the top is in the the low, like the mid 44 area, somewhere around there. Uh, so today, uh, paper did trade 21,800 of the March 43 calls over uh, the April 45 calls. Uh, net credit for the trade was 43 cents, meaning they sold the March 43s. And they bought the April 45s. I think the prices were uh, around around the 58 cent range and the uh, 15 cent range for buying the April 45s. So what's funny is this is a customer that's taking profits, it looks like, on the March calls because the open interest was huge. It was around 23,000 contracts on the March 43. So most likely they're closing those calls. And the open interest is only 2300 on the April 45, so they're most likely rolling into those calls. So it's what's amazing is somebody's willing to buy out-of-the-money calls in a technology ETF. Uh, normally, uh, I would say that's a hard road to hoe um, or a hard road to hoe, but it looks like, again, it looks like they're doing kind of a house money roll, taking the money they made on their 45s and, or on their 43s and rolling it into the 45s and just making themselves um, a whole ton of money. So definitely one to watch if the XLK can keep it moving. So it wouldn't take too much for those uh, 45 calls to kick if we uh, start seeing some higher levels soon. And also, too, I have a question actually about the about the EM trade. Let me pull this up here. A listener mail question. This is kind of a l combination listener mail and a combination of uh, odd blocks. So the question is, in response to the 70, 725,000 shares of EM that went up through the offer with the call trading on the offer. Uh, this is uh, Henry2013 asks, Option Insider, I'm horrible with option strategies. I'm assuming that's bullish. Um, if the trader bought stock and sold the calls on a ratio, uh, again, at the, this is the, the 34 and a half level, um, they're only slightly bullish and they really don't think much is going to happen. So it's more of a trade that it's sideways. Um, if in fact, okay, if in fact it's the opposite where the trader bought three calls and sold a hundred shares 
on every on every trade then they're actually they could be really bullish or they're just really expecting the underlying to move a lot they're trying to maximize the leverage on the strike and if you recall um, a trade uh, that was in I guess men's warehouse that was my favorite trade of 2015 the trader that bought the out of the money calls and sold stock on a ratio this is a similar type of trade um, you know if the EEM blows up to let's say 46 or something like that if they have the ratio on they'll do very well what I would say with this one is a very tough one it's a tough one to call I was actually trying to find out exactly which side they're doing on that particular trade because it, it was priced to look like that they had to buy stock and uh, and sell calls so but if it if it in fact is the opposite they're really looking to maximize that leverage on the strike so anyway we'll see but that was only so the funny thing was in EEM in general for this listener mail question the block size is there today uh, it usually trades uh, 330,000 contracts it traded 700,000 contracts today by the end of the day there were uh, there was 50,000 April 35s traded there was 40,000 May 36 and a half calls traded the March 33 calls there was 25,000 traded. So, and that was a spread that looks like they rolled up to the April 35s. They closed their March 33s and they rolled up to their April 35s. So, again, they had there's at least 15 blocks of 20,000 contracts or more in EEM. So, I guess lower interest rates gets everybody or at least the US not raising faster uh, got the market giddy in general um, about the EEM. And with that, we will uh, close the odd block and move into, uh, well, I guess your favorite segment, listener mail. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, and uh, welcome to Listener Mail. We have, uh, uh, this is, you know, again, this is the uh, part of the show where we read your questions, try to answer the questions, uh, and just do the best we can trying to understand what the darn questions are. Um, so what I'm looking at here is, so here's the question, okay? So Mark and the options block dream team. I have to keep, I have to keep it going in the same spirit since this is extremely educational, I'm still not converted to shorter term selling. I was unfair to ask such a broad question, so I'll try to be specific as possible. So I believe this is uh, going back to our LinkedIn. Okay. Um, let's revisit why I shorted a, a one year 25 Delta cash secured put when the vol was at a two year high, right? Uh, the Vega is basically saying it's seventy dollars per volatility point, uh, and further out is much higher than shorter term. So he's saying, as an example, a fourteen basis point drop in one year vol would result in an easy thousand um, dollars on my strategy, uh, where fifteen percent yield is if the option expires worthless. So what he's saying is, all right, the vol so high, if I get a fourteen point drop, I'm going to make six percent. And I would make 15% all in if the option goes out worthless. So the yield obviously appealing to him. A similar kind of theta, $5.55 a day, premium of $1,000 would require around 180 calendar days. Clearly, theta premium collection is not interesting in my strategy yet. So what he's, so what, um, he's saying in this in general is, He's really looking to sell volatility and make money from a drop in vol, implied volatility going down, not so much selling the option and making money just from the daily decay. And by selling a long-term option, I would agree with him. Okay, Gamma is virtually zero, and hence the underlying needs to both trend down and gap sharply before I need to start worrying. He's saying around 30%. He's saying most likely the next time the underlying will gap down significantly is during earnings. Hence, I can either avoid the period around earnings, close prior, or gamble and keep my position through essentially taking a risk of becoming a long-term investor. With the underlying being in the high 70s and then do a wheel of fortune kind strategy on it. And by the wheel of fortune, he means 
okay, you're short the put, it's cash secured, you take the stock, and then you go and write calls against it at the strike strike you took. And the theory goes, uh, you can keep writing those calls, and if you get taken out, you actually end up doing quite well. So, so for his strategy, he's saying, speculation aspect of my simple strategy. Number one, volatility will mean revert down. Good assumption. And two, I strongly believe that there is a sideways year for the entire U.S. market, including tech. Hence, I believe I can capitalize on the speculation if I extend further out in my short selling of my put. So our, our reader here is basically saying, I don't see a whole lot of upside, so I'm just going to sell a put. That's 30% out of the money, and I'll take what I get. Regarding the babysitting question, I can do some babysitting as in watching the position. I can do some low frequency rolling on the delta. I have done once already. I agree there is nothing much else to do here. My guess is he might maybe buy a shorter term put against a longer term put if he gets nervous. Okay. Uh, and let's forget about shorter term selling and theta premium for a second and its nice exponential properties near expiration, which apparently those that worries him uh, if the option falls apart too quick. Okay. The follow-up question is, is which is hopefully more particular. Are there any practical ways of locking in on Vega premium for longer term short puts? Vol dropped seven basis points since I entered, but there is room for much more. I understand that drawing a line in the sand, say a close when the vol drops to the 40s or 30s, is a very good and practical way. But are there other ways to lock in some Vega premium without fully closing on the strategy? That is a very good question. The only thing I could think of is if you, let's say you sold two puts and you made a bunch of money on the two puts, you could buy one put against it and turn it into uh, a ratio put spread. That is not a hundred percent hedge because you're still going to be net short one put, although it would help. Um, the only other thing I could say is you could buy a forward put against it. That would kind of wreck your, you would still keep you short volatility, but then you would no longer be short contracts. Um, and if the underlying kept falling away, you would be able to at least uh, lock in the money that you had made once you bought the put. So, the only thing I could think really is is to buy a shorter term put. Um, and when I mean shorter term, just instead of if you sold, let's say, a one-year output, you're really looking to buy a six-month put to lock in, kind of lock in that volatility gain. Because if at that point, if the stock really fell apart, you would be have a short, you would have a uh, a short calendar spread, and a short calendar spread would do very well if the stock went to zero you'd at least keep the net, you would keep the net premium in the trade uh, overall. And you'd still, actually, you're still short a little bit of, uh, you'd still be short net Vegas. So that's really the only way I can think of offhand that would allow you to do that. Um, and then at, at, at the very end, my background, I'm a hardcore quant guy who understands the theoretical part of options valuation in Greeks inside out, including some very exotic derivative structures. Calendar year Asian options, swaptions, and generation assets. Wow. Okay. That's definitely not vanilla. That said, ironically, most folks like me are not very good with the practical aspects of options trading. So I hope I am not dumbing down the show with impractical questions. <laughs> Smile emoticon. Cheers. I don't mind sharing my first name with the show. Alex. There we go. <laughs> So here's his one-year vol chart for LinkedIn to give you some context. So he's basically, I want to sell a LinkedIn put. And the reality is, uh, I would just say on this particular question, he's absolutely right about uh, as far as selling the volatility. He wants to – selling a longer-term put for that is a good idea for the type of yield you're looking for if you want to buy the stock. But I would just say this. You only naked sell puts in stocks that you want to own, right? Ultimately, a short put is long, will be long stock at some point. So if you want to do it, right, 
there's certainly nothing wrong with selling a longer term put when the vol is very, when the implied volatility is very high. You don't have to do as much with it. And basically every day it just kind of rots away. If the stock doesn't do anything, you end up doing very well. So from a strategy wise, if you want to be long, but just make no mistake, selling puts is getting long the market. There's no way around it. And especially when you've just had some of the moves we've seen, you know, LinkedIn basically cut its stock price by 50% after their earnings. So you have to, you have to be uh, at least cognizant of the fact that that type of a trade uh, could, uh, could very well lead you to owning the stock. So don't be surprised. But doing a cash secured is the smartest way uh, that I can think of. Because one thing you can do with cash secured, like I said, once you buy a put against it, let's say if you created the short calendar, all of a sudden it frees up all that margin to go do something else. Um, so that would be a way to create the trade. And then you're like, you will be happy with the yield you got if you still want the volatility to go down. Um, that might help. Um, right? Because that would, on, especially on a stack like LinkedIn, it would free up a lot of capital. Um, you're going to get less yield, uh, but you also have more capital to go do something else with. And your LinkedIn trade is pretty much taken care of. All right. And with that, I guess that was, that was such a significant listener question that I think we're going to close uh, this round of listener mail. And we will move right into Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. This is Around the Block. This is where uh, we, as in me right now, uh, the Rock Lobster, <laughs> is going. Uh, we're going to talk about um, what is happening in the markets. And as far as I can tell, uh, what's happening in the markets is Interest rates look benign. Um, apparently, the, the Fed sees some growth, just not a lot. Uh, and they are going to take a pause about global conditions. So overall, I think that was a – it's slightly positive. I don't know if it's sounding less jangy or jaggedy than the Fed has sounded in the past. Uh, but basically, they said we're going to cut from four rises to two. Uh Again, not saying how big those, I think, right? They're giving themselves some room on how big those rate hikes can be. But the market actually liked that because they saw some growth. They saw some risk. It wasn't enough to make everybody just totally pitch off the end of a boat. So what do I expect? You know, at this point with VIX at 14 and a half, I, you know, vol should move down a little lower. And for stocks to rally, really, I just think we need some good news. Um, it, earnings season is only uh, four weeks, what is it, three weeks away until Alcoa kicks it off. So that could be the stuff that uh, drives us to the next level. A rise in oil prices could drive us up to the next level. Any kind of stability or clarity on what's going on in the, uh, in the your average European bank, uh, that would help as well. So these are all things that could uh, make stocks rally and we just have to see if that happens or not. Um, but in uh, in uh, on the Options Insider website, you can go to the March Madness poll via the Options Insider. You can vote for your favorite broker and be entered to win prizes. Voting starts on Tuesday, and I'm guessing that is either last Tuesday or next Tuesday. But go to the OptionsInsider.com for more information. Uh, just a couple of earnings announcements. Uh, FedEx announced today. It was quite fantastic, stock up a bunch. Uh, we're looking for Adobe, Oracle was yesterday. And Tiffany is Friday. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, that poll was last <laughs> last Tuesday. So anyway, uh, jump in there, vote, get going, and, uh, <laughs> and you could be on your way as you uh, – as you vote in the options insider poll. All right. And lastly, um, what do we got? What got going here at the end of the day for me? So we'll close that section of around the block. And uh, well, 
uh, what do I have going? Uh, Mark and I will be doing a webinar on diagonal spread trading and uh, margin management. I would say it's a, as opposed to our boot camp the last time, which I'd say is a beginning course, this is going to be an advanced course around diagonal spread trading where you use margin, but you use it in a smart way. And it helps you really trade volatility in volatile markets and volatile stocks where you try to control the gamma, but short, uh, try to create a short vol position. So that will be diagonal spreading. Uh, you should see something on the options on the option pit website soon under events. So go to option pit forward slash event for anybody that wants to uh, learn or understand how to trade short diagonal spreads. And with that, I think we are going to close this episode of the option block. Uh, everybody, thanks for stopping in. We are glad that you uh, download our podcast through all the many, many, many Stitcher iTunes, the Kindle Fire, and any other uh, social media connected type device there is. You will find the Options Insider on it. And with that, the Rock Lobster bids you adieu until next week, right here from the Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.